Well, hey there, everybody. I am live here to answer your questions. It's Lori McLean. I'll give everybody a few moments to find their way here. Got my technical assistant helping me tonight. My wife is going to field questions. Are you able to see it over there? Oh, good, hon. Okay. We will just wait a few seconds for those to come in. And if not, we will just go ahead and you can catch this in the replay. So for those of you that are new to the page, that maybe aren't familiar with me or my my story, my journey, I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis at the age of two, and this year I will be turning 42. So that marks the 40th year with rheumatoid arthritis. About three years ago, I was uh, declared to be in remission thanks to rheumatoid, or sorry, methotrexate, Humira, and Celebrex have been the drugs that this time around have pushed me to remission for the first time ever. So life is a little bit different for me now, being in this body with minimal pain, zero stiffness, and uh, fatigue, nah, just a little bit, but it's mostly from the methotrexate and the Humira. So yeah, like I say, this is a, a whole new adventure for me, and I decided at that point, when I was declared to be in remission, that I wanted to spread some hope to those that were still in the dark and still fighting with the disease that I knew too well, oh so well at that point. And um, so I started a YouTube page and I called it RA Raw initially because it was going to be in the raw. I was going to do a vlog, but I, I quickly came to note that I do not do enough in a day to warrant having a camera on me all the time. So I decided, nah, let's change that up a little. Let's just put out some content for everyone to hopefully, you know, enjoy and get some education. So that's what I do now. I don't know if we've got, I can't tell if there's anybody in here. So excuse me while I put on my glasses. Oh, good. We have one person. It's my mom. Hi, mom. I, uh, like I say, for those of you that are going to be catching this in the replay, I do have a few questions that people had sent in already, and uh, so I'll be answering those. And I realize Wednesday nights might be a bit difficult, but um, if that is the case, if there's a better night that will work for everyone, just let me know, and I'll make it happen. So if you want to put in the comments below, if you're watching this in the replay, what nights work for you, what times even, even if it's during the day, maybe during the day on a – on a Saturday would be better. I, I don't know. So that just let me know. So what we're going to do, or what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and just start answering some questions that came in to me uh, via email. And one of the ones that um, someone had asked me, and it's, it's a long answered question, but I'm going to try and squish it down as best as I can. And they wanted to know how to reduce the inflammation that they have in their body. Um, a while ago, I wrote an ebook about that very subject and uh, it is available if you would like it um, I can send it out for you free of charge all you need is you know just the ability to to read it receive it send me your email anyways you can go to rarawchannel.webnode.com I'll put that address in the description below as well and uh, yeah I'll send you the ebook out as soon as I can so in that book, I discuss a few different ways of reducing inflammation, things that I actually have done. Because once I went into remission, I thought, okay, so I'm here now. What can I do to actually feel better? Because before, I just felt like crap all the time. I couldn't see an out, so to speak. But now that I was sitting in remission, I was able to tell and I was able to feel what things made a difference. So one of the first things I began doing was attacking inflammation from a food standpoint. It always made sense to me that what we put in our bodies can cause inflammation. So I started weeding out things like bread, pasta, rice. I started getting rid of those things, and I'm not kidding you, within, I don't know, a week, 
maybe a week and a half, I could feel a big difference. The word of a lie, I could. Now I've been eating fairly clean. I mean, there's sometimes, right, where we all just want a potato chip. And so, but when I eat those things, especially I have noticed, and I love this stuff, but pizza, oh my God, I love this stuff. My wife loves this stuff. We, we can consume a lot of pizza, and we did. But when I eat pizza now, I realize that within an hour, two hours, my hands, they're feeling full. They're feeling stiff. It's difficult to move. So that's one of the things, right? The white, refined, unrefined, whatever, flour, whatever it is. Anyway, the white stuff. It's not, it's not so good for us. And I can tell you that I notice, I imagine the, you know, the processed deli meat also not good because it's got a lot of, it's got a lot of sodium in it. So that's one of the things, like I say, I started doing was attacking inflammation from a food standpoint. And within that, I did tons of research, came across the diet called the anti-inflammatory protocol. And I follow that as best as I can, as good as I can. Uh, so basically, if, if it can't be caught shot or grown, I try not to eat it. That's just how it goes. Now, with that way of eating has also come weight loss, which for me is really, really important because, you know, over the years I led very sedentary lifestyle. It hurt to move. It really did. I woke up in the morning, put my feet on the floor, and it felt like I'd been walking for five or six hours already. And, you know, so I know for people out there who say exercise is difficult because it hurts too much. I so, oh, I get that. I really do. But now for me, I don't have the pain that I used to. So I'm able to move a little better. So there you go. That's another point of combating inflammation. And that is exercise, of course. So as I said, to answer that question in long form, I have that ebook that you can get. Um, but one of the other questions that I was asked was, what was the signs that my parents noticed that tipped them off that there was something going on when I was little? Now, remember, I was two years old when my mom took me to the doctor and said, there's something not right here. She says that there have been signs since I was six months to a year old. For one thing, I was very delayed in walking. Um, that she said I talked first not surprising for those of you that know me anyway so I talked first I didn't walk till a bit later so I talked at seven months but walking I'm not sure maybe mom you can chime in and, and type in the comments below and let everyone know when I maybe started to walk if you can remember I know it was a while ago but maybe you can so I could say that was Looking back on it now, she goes, oh, that might have been a sign that there was something going on. But the first thing that she said, this doesn't seem right, was I started to develop lumps on my wrists. And, you know, for those of you that maybe have them, um, now I know that it's synovial fluid around the, the tendon sheath is what it is. But I've always had these lumps. Now I'm in remission and they are mostly gone. So... But I got lumps on my wrists and on my ankles, and that's what made her take me to the doctor. And at that point, the doctor, you know, of course said, well, if they've lasted for this long, we need to look into it. They started doing tests, blood work, I would imagine, and yeah, they discovered that I had rheumatoid arthritis. So like I say, two years old, that was the first, the first sign. And from there, it, you know, it, it progressed, of course. It was in my, my wrists and ankles first, and then it progressed to knees, elbows, shoulders. And uh, eventually, at the age of eight, it moved into my eyes. Now, this leads me to another question, and that is, why do you always ask, tell people to go see an optometrist regularly if they have rheumatoid arthritis? And that is because that is one of the things that I think very few people know that it can move to your eyes. And for me, it did. Like I say, eight years old, I started having trouble seeing the chalkboard at school. And, you know, my teacher said, okay, we've, we've moved Lori to the front of the class, but she seems to still be having difficulty. She let my mom know that this is what was going on. 
So mom, being just like every other parent, took me to the eye doctor for a regular exam. At that point, the eye doctor that I had took a look in my eyes and said, wait a minute here. Something's not right. Again, just like with the lumps on my wrist, the doctor said something's not right. With my eyes, he said, there seems to be inflammation and that doesn't look right to me. So from there on in, it just, you know, it began specialists and going to the doctor regularly, the optometrist, the ophthalmologist. Lisa's letting me know, my wife is letting me know that the signal has perhaps dropped, but I am still showing live. So I'm going to keep going, but that's okay because that's okay. I am seeing, I'm just going to, I'm going to take a wee break from that story and just see if we have, we have anybody else checking in here. Hi, little brother. So back to the story about my eyes, eight years old, went to the optometrist. He said, there's something, something going on. And from there I was sent to a retinal specialist who yeah, confirmed that it was iritis. So I was put on medicine to keep the inflammation down to delay the effect of prolonged inflammation in the eyes. But he told my mom and dad at that point that I was put on the meds. We know that these are going to have a side effect, but we're not quite sure what it's going to be yet. Well, about two, maybe three years down the road, um, that side effect became very, very apparent as I started to develop cataracts on my eyes. So this is why I tell people, if you have rheumatoid arthritis, go to your optometrist regularly because I'm not sure really if anybody, you know, knows if they don't have someone in their family or in their life that has rheumatoid arthritis that has moved to their eyes, that is not common knowledge. And that's not something that's shared regularly, right? So that's, that's the reason why. So like I say, cataract started and then with that came more more complications um, glaucoma acute angle closure glaucoma I'm actually going to do a whole other broadcast on my eyes because I have I do believe that although it's arthritis related and it's because of my arthritis that I've I've had these issues with my eyes um, but it I mean it can take a very long time to explain it all and go into it so I'm just I try and compartmentalize it a little bit and talk about my eyes separate from my joints. So as you can probably see by me waving my hands around here because I am a hand talker, um, over the years deformities took place and you know I started to have fused joints and that was just how it was 40 years ago when you know I was being treated for this 30 years ago even. In the last 20 years things have really come a long ways. It wasn't until the advent of biologics that the landscape really changed for those of us out there with rheumatoid arthritis. People were going into remission, like I say, like me, for the first time ever, and that's huge. Now there are so many new biologics out there. You know, there's Arencia, Remicade, I can go on and name a whole whack of them, but I was lucky in the fact that for me, when I started on Humira, that was the drug that worked for me. So. You know, if you're on a biologic and you're not happy with the results that it's giving you, if perhaps you're still having pain, if you feel that your inflammation is still too high. Another really important thing that I talk to people about is having clear lines of communication with your rheumatologist and being able to sit down with he or her and say, listen, these drugs, I, I'm not really happy with what they're doing. You know, sometimes it takes kind of taking a cattle prod and, and poking your rheumatologist and saying, can we maybe try something else? Now, with that being said, if one of your drugs is making you feel horrible, then comes time for a decision. And that decision is, are the results outweighing the side effects? Earlier this week, I posted... Um, a couple of memes about side effects. And it was meant as somewhat of a joking thing, you know, I, I like to keep humor out there for us all. But what I was wanting to have us all think about is, yeah, these side effects, I mean, we all know, they are reams and reams of paper long, 
when we start getting into methotrexate, Humira, Remicade, Arencia, all those, the side effects can be very scary. So when I started on Humira, this is now just about six, maybe seven years ago. I remember this very well, and I'm sure my wife can attest to this, that when I got noticed that that drug was going to be covered and that I was going to get it, and I was able to start Humira, I got this letter in the mail, and oh my goodness, it, it brought tears to my eyes, and then I started to full-on cry. Because I'd read what the side effects of this could be, but I'd also read the success that people were having. And I knew at that point that it was either going to go one of two ways for me. I was either going to have hideous side effects and not be able to leave my home because I would, you know, catch a cold or catch the flu and it would quickly become something very scary and I would end up hospitalized. Or it would change my life. And in fact, that's exactly what it has done. It has changed my life. And I've been very lucky again, knock on wood, that I have not had a lot of complications with that. Um, I'm very, very diligent on taking my supplements. If I feel a cold coming on, I take vitamin C. And I will increase that vitamin C. Take vitamin D on a daily basis. And... Um, you know, just there again, talk to your rheumatologist about what supplements he or she suggests that you be on. My rheumatologist suggests that I be on vitamin C, vitamin D, that I get the flu shot. There again, that's a, that's a choice that you need to make. Do you want to get the flu shot? So I'm just going to take another look here in the comments section and see what we got going on. Alrighty. So as I said, you know, I was, I was sent some questions via email so this is good because we can we can answer those um one of the other ones was what joints were affected first and as i mentioned before it was ankles wrists now here's another thing for parents out there who perhaps their child has juvenile rheumatoid arthritis are there you know maybe the doctors are looking into this and this is what it might be know this most times, I can't say for certain because I'm not sure of the statistics and I don't want to give any information because I'm, you know, that might not be 100%, but I'll tell you what I know. And that is that rheumatoid arthritis is always symmetrical. If it affects one wrist, it'll affect the other. If it affects one knee, it'll affect the other and so forth. So if you have been diagnosed and it's right now in your left wrist. Keep an eye out because it will show up in your right wrist as well. There again, they don't know why, but it's just a symmetrical disease. That's how it works. So for me, my left side has always been the worst. My knee would swell up to, you know, the size of a football. And it was always my left one that would do that. So, you know, that that's just how it would always go for me is that there's one side that's always worse. My left hand has more uh, fusion. It has more deviation. And so does my left foot. So like I say, maybe, maybe you have, and if you do put that in the comments, because I'm always curious to know how other people are affected by this. I mean, that's, there are, you know, 300,000, I believe children in Canada who are affected with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And just off the top of my head, I cannot remember the stats for adults, but the number is growing exponentially. So, you know, we all have this, this thing in common and it affects all of us very uniquely, but it also affects us the same. So like I say, put in the comments below, let me know, how are you affected? Do you have one side that's worse than the other? Let me know. So to carry on with the questions, we're gonna wrap up here right away because I don't wanna keep everyone too, too long. But uh, the questions, and that is, how has the landscape of medicine changed in the last 40 years? Well, it's unbelievable. It really is. When I was diagnosed in 1979, um, the treatment was, it wasn't, there wasn't a whole heck of a lot out there. Cortisone injections was one of the ones. Entrophin was a, a drug that was prescribed. Now, 
the last time I knew you could buy Entrofen on the you know over the counter. It is a simple pain reliever, and that's what was available. Gold shots were the you know kind of the the top of the chain, so to speak, of what was available. My parents resisted putting me on gold shots because it, it had, and I believe it's still used to this day, actually. My parents resisted putting me on gold shots because of the side effects. It deposited in the eyes. Now, little did we know, you know, however many years later, I was going to get arthritis in my eyes. So I think I thank them, you know, every day in my mind that they didn't, further exacerbate things by choosing to put me on on a drug that could have caused even more problems but that was the one choice that you know they they were they were very adamant about that about not putting me on gold so like i say it was cortisone injections now i just <laughs> i just had a conversation the other day with someone about humor and how humor is used for those of us with chronic illnesses like this and I said I began to find that humor helped at a very young age and the way I did that was I would joke around with my rheumatologist when she was getting ready to give me my cortisone injection now the reason I did that was not because <laughs> I was a funny kid and I wanted to joke around and whatever it was because I was trying to delay the rheumatologist from injecting me wherever and I was really hoping that she would forget that I'd get her laughing and she would get sidetracked and walk out of the room and the, the visit would be over. Of course, that never happened. The cortisone injection always took place. So that was, like I say, that was kind of the mainstay. And for many, many years, that was one of the only go-tos. So um, that's how, you know, it, it was. And, but it became very, very clear very soon that the cortisone yeah that was not working so well because I would freak out and it seemed to have not great effects so then along came methotrexate and that one I was probably on that drug for about I don't know gosh again mom can you chime in and maybe let everyone know below I'm so grateful that my mom is here tonight to, one of these times I will get her on here with me and and we will discuss in person and chat with you all anyways so I want to say I was on that drug for about 10 years and it it made me sick but it, there wasn't a whole heck of a lot out there so that's what was used and then Celebrex came onto the market and again that one was that one helped a little bit more so but it wasn't until like I said the last 20 years when things really began to explode and these biologics came onto the market so that is all the questions that I have for tonight that people have sent me. But please, I'm going to be doing these, these Facebook Lives. I want to try and do them every week. So like I say, let me know what works for you all. Because the main thing for me is that this page is a place that you all can come to to get information, but that you can also discuss what's happening in, in your world and let me know, you know, maybe we can get some community going on and whatever. So like I say, let me know what works for you and yeah, we will go from there. So everybody take care. I'm going to sign off for now and let you all go. Thank you for watching this in the replay and yeah, we will see you all next time around. Oh, by the way, one more thing. Stay right there. Earlier this week, I put a new video up on YouTube. And it's actually a guided meditation for relaxation. So I will be putting the link in the comments for you. And you can go there. Um, stress relief. Huge, 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 big time important to keep your inflammation simmered down, if not completely at bay. So I started using um, meditation a couple of years ago. You know, it's one of those things that... I bounce out of it for a while and then I bounce back into it and I go, oh, why did I ever stop doing this? Because it, it relaxes me. It does help with stress. It makes me feel so good. So I put together a guided meditation uh, where we take a little journey and we just chill and relax and through the sounds of the ocean wafting and, you know, delightful music playing. Hopefully that will help you to relax. I suggest that you listen to it each night before you go to sleep and yeah. Or in the morning when you wake up too.
listen to it anytime you're feeling stressed out. But yeah, I'm going to put that link in the description below as well. Alrighty, everybody take care. Bye for now.